Namaste, my dear brothers and sisters. The love and blessings of the mother and Sri Aurobindo to all of you from Sri Aurobindo Ashram Delhi branch. Today's topic, uh, which is uh, the physiology of the pregnant woman. Uh, and uh, is again one of those uh, remarkable feats of uh, the divine. Uh, now, starting with a single cell, a microscopic speck, uh, we end up in a relatively short period. Nine months is too short a period to accomplish that miracle. We end up with a three kilo bundle of joy within three months, within nine months, starting with uh, a microscopic speck. Not only it grows, it also differentiates into various organs. And it is amazing that in spite of all the uh, miniature scale with which we start uh, and uh, the miniature scale at which this blueprint is uh, available in the genes, we end up with a product that is as perfect as it is at the end of these nine months. Uh, the organs are all well formed. The limbs are uh, uh, well formed. The person is bilaterally symmetrical. Both sides develop equally well. And uh, the complicated heart has its uh, partitions and valves at the right place. Now, all these things are, uh, in fact, uh, truly amazing. And uh, we should just touch the surface of this process today when we talk about pregnancy. With this, I go to the slides. Just for recapitulation of the system, with the ovaries where the eggs are formed, the egg which will be fertilized by the sperm to lead to the beginning of the baby. And uh, this is the tube through which uh, the egg travels, uh, even otherwise, but uh, particularly after fertilization. And uh, after fertilization, this journey becomes important. Uh, it travels to the uterus where it will eventually grow into the baby. Now, this is the ovary, and uh, we can see the development of the egg starting with these uh, uh, primitive cells, which uh, divide and differentiate finally into the egg here, which, uh, surrounded by a few other cells, is expelled from the ovary, and uh, what remains behind uh, develops into the corpus luteum, which then secretes those hormones, which carry further the preparation of the uterus for a pregnancy which might occur. And if it doesn't, then it just winds up and ends up as this corpus albicans. It's car sort of a thing. Uh, and uh, the hormones are withdrawn because uh, uh, the corpus luteum has wound up, it has dismantled. And so the uterus also starts dismantling all the preparation that had been made for uh, the guest that might arrive. Now, today we'll talk about the situation in which the guest does actually arrive. And uh, now here is the egg, uh, which uh, has traveled part of the way in the fallopian tube. And uh, at the right time, the male spermatozoa, the sperms, have been delivered. Now, out of a few million sperm that are delivered at a time, uh, we find that uh, only a few hundred are able to travel upstream through the vagina and uh, reach the tube where the egg actually is. And uh, which are these few hundred? Probably the healthiest and the strongest ones because they have to swim, swim against the current. And uh, we shall talk more about it in detail when we talk about the male reproductive system. But uh, perhaps the best are the, uh, the strongest and therefore, perhaps the best ones are selected. So some sort of a selection takes place here, which would ensure better quality of the child that would be born. Now, out of a few hundred that reach here, again, there's only one lucky one that actually is able to get into the egg and uh, fertilize the egg. And after one has entered, there seems to be a mechanism which will prevent a second one from entering the cell. So the rest are all left in the lurch. They are frustrated and uh, they're not allowed to enter. 
So that mechanism for shutting the door to the rest after one has entered is also ensured in this process of fertilization. Now here's a microscopic view of the fertilized uh, egg. Uh, this is the sperm that has just entered the egg with its head and a long tail. You can see part of the tail here. So this shows a little more of the process. The egg shed from the ovary, uh, traveling in the fallopian tube, and uh, then getting fertilized here by the sperm, and then traveling further. And while it is traveling, it doesn't sit idle. You know, it gets uh, into the process right away. Uh, and uh, it's a very hardworking guest. It doesn't uh, treat itself to the luxury of uh, being received so well. Uh, it uh, gets to work straight away and starts dividing. Uh, because uh, unless we have a starting quota of uh, a few cells, we will not have enough material for the cells to differentiate into different organs. And that process starts right in this tube. And uh, uh, it's after about three days that it reaches the uterus. And uh, in another three days, it has started uh, implanting itself at a, a point in the uterine wall. So this is where it will get fixed. And this process of getting fixed here, attaching itself here, is what we call implantation. So at the end of about one week after fertilization, it has uh, started getting implanted here. Now, while it is uh, dividing in the tube and while getting implanted, it uh, first divides into two identical cells, then two become four, four become eight, eight becomes 16, and finally it becomes a ball of cells. But then as it divides, the cells that result from this division are smaller in size, with the result that the size of the fertilized egg hardly changes. The fertilized egg is called the zygote. So the size remains the same as that of the zygote or the fertilized egg, uh, but the, you know, the number of cells has increased considerably. So it's just a ball of small sized cells and then begins the initial, begin the initial stages of differentiation. You can see a cavity formed here and the cells are uh, migrating to this side. So that process has also begun. Now, uh, this ball of cells is now trying to get implanted in the wall of the uterus. This is the wall of the uterus where it is trying to attach itself. And of course, the entire uterine wall is uh, well prepared for it. There's a red carpet welcome waiting for this guest. And uh, then the guest, like a hardworking guest, uh, gets into the job, I mean, it doesn't treat itself like a guest. Uh, it works together with the, the host to uh, not only get attached here, to implant itself here, but also to start cooking the food. So what it does, it does is to digest a part of the uterine wall uh, to create that soup, which will uh, now provide the nourishment to the growing baby. Uh, we are calling it a baby, although it hardly looks like a baby. We still call it only an embryo. So this embryo uh, has to have a food supply, and it starts manufacturing its uh, food. It participates in manufacturing the food by uh, dissolving. Sometimes we call it digesting because there's a breakdown that takes place here to create some sort of a soup, which will uh, then nourish the zygote. Not only it nourishes the zygote, it also starts producing an important hormone, an important hormone, which uh, is the basis of the pregnancy test. You shall see that in a moment. And what that hormone does, which works like the luteinizing hormone, is to ensure that the corpus luteum will not wind up. You know, normally the corpus luteum winds up a week, uh, starts winding up about a week after the ovulation, and by two weeks, it has wound itself up completely and then begins the menstrual cycle, menstruation. Now here, uh, that will not happen because this starts working like the luteinizing hormone, keeps the corpus luteum intact so that the corpus luteum will continue to produce those hormones, which will further make this uterine wall more hospitable. And uh, because of that, uh, the ovulation will not uh, take place in the next cycle. The uterus will just continue to be in that pregnant state 
as it was at the beginning of uh, soon after ovulation it will continue to be then state and in fact develop further in the same direction so it uh, not only uh, creates uh, this soup which will serve as food but also ensures that this environment will continue to be hospitable by stimulating the release of those hormones uh, uh, which uh, releasing those hormones which will keep the uterus hospitable. So this is another view of uh, the implanted uh, embryo here and uh, you can see that now it has created a, some sort of a pit here and in the pit there is a soup out of which it gets implanted. Another view of the same, day eight, uh, a day or two after the process of implantation began and you find that uh, in this pit, it is now firmly planted and this is that soup uh, as it is, which has formed as a result of breakdown of uh, cells and all the material here. So that has formed this soup which will nourish as well as make those hormones. A day further, day nine, Further development along the same lines and day 12, still further development along the same lines. You can find that now it is further deeper down and uh, we have surrounded by this soup. And uh, uh, now just sort of uh, recap, why is there no menstruation during pregnancy? Because the hormones that keep the uterus intact and ready for the baby continue to be produced. And uh, these hormones continue to be produced because of a hormone called the human chorionic gonadotropin or HCG, which acts like the luteinizing hormone. Now, this HCG is produced in this soup that we were talking about. And the pregnancy test depends upon the presence of this human chorionic gonadotropin or HCG in the urine. It can be detected in the urine uh, in pregnancy tests four weeks after the last menstrual period. And uh, as you would recollect, uh, the egg is released from the ovary about two weeks after the last menstrual period. So, but the woman comes to know that she might be pregnant only when she misses a period. And therefore, the date which is known uh, with some certainty by the woman is the date on which she had her last period. So, last menstrual period. And uh, two weeks after that, probably she uh, became pregnant. And four weeks after that, we can detect it. So, which means when we are able to detect, the embryo is about two weeks old. So, the embryo has been growing for about two weeks. It got implanted about a week before that. So, it takes one week to get implanted. So, it has been implanted a week before. And within one week, it's able to produce enough of HCG for it to be detected in the urine. But then. Uh, this is only a makeshift arrangement. Creating this soup here in this pit is a makeshift arrangement. What will eventually nourish the baby in further development is the formation of the placenta. And uh, that also begins pretty early, uh, around day 16 of the pregnancy, as early as that. Although the proper function, full function of the placenta will uh, uh, it will fully take over at about eight weeks. Uh, but uh, the process begins pretty early. So, if you look at the sources of nourishment for the baby, we find that uh, uh, there is a whole sequence which uh, right from the beginning. So, it comes prepared for its with its food supply. The egg comes prepared with its food supply even before it has been fertilized. And that's why the egg is so much bigger than the sperm because uh, the sperm is basically the nucleus uh, which will fertilize. But uh, the egg not only has that nucleus as in any cell, the o egg also has a considerable amount of food stored within uh, so that uh, after fertilization, it will be able to live on that for a couple of days. And uh, then in the surroundings, which it finds in the fallopian tube, again, there are secretions, that is uh, juices made by the fallopian tube, which will be able to nourish it up to day three and uh, then it uh, 
after the third day, usually it is in the uterus where the same process will continue uh, because the uterus also has secretions which will be able to nourish it up to the first week. And after that, as it gets implanted, it will create that juice by digesting some cells of the uterus and this can continue to nourish it up to the eighth week. But uh, the placenta also starts contributing to this nourishment from the third week onwards. And by the eighth week, the placenta can take over completely. So you can see that there is a uh, very elaborate planning here, anticipating what will be enough only for a short period and can therefore serve only as a makeshift arrangement. And in anticipation of uh, that source becoming inadequate, the next source is already getting prepared. Here's a diagrammatic picture of the placenta. Now, here, on this side is the uterus. That is the uterine wall, uh, which is uh, uh, the mother's uh, part. And this is the placenta and the uterine cavity in which is the fetus, that is the baby. Now, we can look at it from either end. Uh, let's start with, say, the mother's end. Uh, just as the mother is sending an artery to every part of the body, it is also sending arteries to the uterus. And uh, a, a few branches of this uterine artery, that is, which is supplying blood to the uterus, enter the placenta. And uh, as from any other organ, after giving up some oxygen and picking up carbon dioxide and other waste products, the blood leaves uh, the placenta in the uterine vein. Now, the baby also has arteries and veins. And uh, just as the baby is sending arteries to every part of the body, the baby is also sending through the umbilical artery blood into the, this umbilical artery, that is the artery passing through the umbilical cord, that rope-like structure that connects the fetus to the mother. So it is through this umbilical cord that uh, this umbilical artery uh, finally enters the placenta. And uh, then out comes the umbilical vein after picking up some oxygen and giving up some carbon dioxide. So you can see that uh, this artery is not actually giving up oxygen, it is collecting oxygen. And uh, this is something like what happens in the lungs. That is the pulmonary artery goes to the lungs and picks up oxygen and gives up carbon dioxide. So for the fetus, this umbilical artery, and it's passing through the placenta, is doing something similar to what happens in the lungs. So the placenta is serving as the lungs of the baby. It is uh, through this blood that is passing through the placenta that oxygen is picked up and carbon dioxide given up, other waste products given up, and nourishment like glucose also is picked up. So nourishment like glucose getting picked up is something similar to what happens in the gastrointestinal tract. So the placenta is also working like the gastrointestinal tract of the baby. And uh, besides carbon dioxide, other waste products are also given up here, sent into the mother's blood. So this placenta is also working like the kidneys for the baby. So it's a three-in-one structure for the baby, at least a three-in-one. It has a fourth function also, which we shall come to, that is manufacturing hormones. So what this placenta is doing is providing a thin membrane, a membrane or a partition which is extremely, which is allowing an extremely free passage of gases and nutrients and waste products. And the result is that when these two uh, blood vessels, and uh, you know here the surface is folded again uh, to increase the surface area, uh, this point at which this thin partition, which allows freely the passage of oxygen, carbon dioxide, waste products and nutrients like glucose across this exchange takes place from the mother to the fetal blood so far as oxygen nourishment is concerned and the other way that is carbon dioxide and waste products from the fetal blood into the mother's blood and uh, that's how the when the blood returns to the fetus through this umbilical vein this has more oxygen than the blood that entered, less carbon dioxide, more glucose, and uh, 
less of waste products like urea. So this is sort of the triple function of uh, the placenta acting as the lungs, the gastrointestinal tract, as well as the kidneys of the fetus. And this it can continue, this is a function that it can continue to serve till the end of pregnancy. This structure is big enough and uh, has enough capacity to take care of these needs till the very end of pregnancy. The other arrangements before that were only makeshift arrangements till the placenta could be formed. And the placenta also starts forming quite early around the, uh, the 16th day and is fully ready by the 8th week. And it's only after the 8th week that we call the baby not an embryo, but a fetus. Because by the 8th week, it starts looking a bit like a human being. It's differentiated enough to have the features of a human being, and then we call it the fetus. So the functions of the placenta are to act as the lungs, the intestines or the gut, and the kidneys of the fetus. Apart from that, it produces a number of hormones. One of those we've already talked about, the human chorionic gonadotropin or HCG. That stimulates the corpus luteum, you know, just like the luteinizing hormone. So it acts like uh, LH. It stimulates the corpus luteum. And uh, as a result, the corpus luteum will continue to secrete estrogen and progesterone, which will uh, maintain the uterus in good shape. And in fact, keep it, make it further ready for supporting the fetus in that uterine environment. And uh, the placenta itself also produces the same hormones so that it will be able to take over that function also completely. It manufactures estrogen, which enlarges the uterus, the breasts, and relaxes some ligaments. Uh, ligaments, you know, are uh, structures with a very high tensile strength. They can stand a great deal of pull. And we'll talk more about them when we come to the bones and joints. Uh, but uh, these, you know, are uh, across joints and uh, they stabilize the joints. But then uh, here, this is a situation in which some relaxation of these ligaments is necessary to, for the baby to be able to get out when the time for delivery comes. And uh, that is something that the estrogen does during pregnancy. The large amounts of estrogen that are eventually secreted by the placenta, far more than what corpus luteum was able to secrete. And uh, then progesterone, which is in fact the hormone that lets the pregnancy go on by inhibiting uterine contraction. It relaxes the uterus, doesn't let it contract, because contraction would mean uh, the uh, baby that is growing that might be thrown out. And uh, that's why uh, in uh, a woman who has uh, repeated abortions, one of the things that is given from outside is progesterone, because that will continue, which that will help the continuation of the pregnancy by inhibiting the uterine contraction. It thickens the uterine wall and not just making the bed softer, but also uh, serving on the bed uh, food to the baby. And uh, that's, you know, the blood vessels also multiply, they become uh, thicker and uh, tortuous, and then glands, which would secrete uh, the necessary secretions. And uh, it acts also outside the uterus, preparing the breast for milk secretion. So estrogens and progesterone and other hormones are contributing in different ways to make the breasts ready for uh, lactation, which will be required soon after delivery, immediately after delivery. So that pro process also continues. Uh, estrogen sort of equip the breasts with the nuts and the bolts, and the progesterone sort of further equips the factory, assembles those nuts and bolts to uh, make the factory production ready and uh, there will be other hormones which will uh, come in to actually start the milk production. And one of those is this hormone manufactured in the placenta, human chorionic somatomamotropin, uh, HCS. Uh, it actually 
uh, kick starts the production of milk in the factory, which has been assembled by the estrogen and the progesterone. And uh, another thing that HCS does is to decrease glucose utilization in the mother. That is having effects somewhat opposite to those of insulin. Uh, we saw that insulin, you know, uh, increases the glucose utilization in the cells and also increases glucose utilization for manufacturing the storage forms such as uh, glycogen. But uh, here, this hormone does the opposite. Uh, as a result, the blood glucose levels would go up because uh, in the mother, the glucose utilization has become more difficult and uh, it is not being sufficiently stored as like the surplus glucose is not being stored as glycogen. So the mother's blood glucose level would go up and higher level of blood glucose in the blood that is now passing through the uh, placenta and uh, giving up its glucose to the fetus, that higher level will ensure that more of glucose will be able to pass to the baby. Now, while this is very good, it also means that uh, the mother has a higher blood glucose level. It still stays within the normal limits, but it creates the tendency in a susceptible woman to actually get diabetes. And that's how one can get gestational diabetes, that is diabetes of pregnancy, which reverses itself when all these uh, when factors like this disappear and the woman is back to normal. But development of diabetes during pregnancy is a warning that the woman is at a higher risk for developing diabetes later in life. She is at a higher risk as compared to others who did not develop this type of a diabetes during pregnancy. And therefore, what it means is that this woman, by adopting a healthier lifestyle, might be able to delay considerably the expression of this diabetes in later life. Because it's diabetes, you know, it's basically the tendency. It's a tendency to develop diabetes and uh, this tendency can express itself at different stages in life depending upon the lifestyle. And if uh, by adopting a healthy lifestyle, uh, the person is able to delay it to the age of say 80, then it's as good as not getting diabetes. So this is a sort of a warning. And uh, therefore, I mean, one should get the blood glucose test done periodically during pregnancy. And uh, another hormone that the placenta manufactures is relaxin. And as the name indicates, it relaxes the uterus, as does progesterone. This also relaxes the uterus so that it will not contract prematurely and the baby will be able to stay undisturbed. It will not try to throw out the guest. And uh, it relaxes the ligaments in preparation for the delivery so that the delivery will be easier. Now, this is how the embryo looks at uh, 44 days. It's still called an embryo, not yet the fetus. Fetus, we call it after the eighth week, that is after about 56 days. Now, this may be a right point to talk about morning sickness because morning sickness typically appears around this time and uh, uh, may continue throughout the first trimester, that is the first one third of the pregnancy, the first uh, 12 weeks or so. Uh, and uh, although it's called morning sickness, it doesn't necessarily happen only in the mornings. And uh, it consists of a feeling of nausea and vomiting. The woman may not actually vomit, but it's an unpleasant feeling and can occur several times in the day, not only in the morning, but also later in the day. And in some cases, it may be more severe and she may actually vomit. And sometimes it can be so severe as to lead to dehydration. Uh, and that is when it uh, needs more attention. Uh, but this is something which uh, passes off and uh, vanishes on its own after about two months. It starts about a month after the missed period and vanishes after about two months and occurs in about 70% of women. So it can be considered essentially normal. <laughs> Consists of nausea, a feeling. Uh, as if the woman feels as if I might vomit and sometimes actually vomits and uh, may occur at any time of the day. Another thing that a woman might notice in the first trimester 
is uh, passing urine more often. And, uh, but at the same time, this, this disappears in the second trimester. This happens in the first trimester because uh, the uh, growing uterus starts pressing on the bladder and therefore the bladder pressure goes up more frequently and therefore the woman passes urine more frequently. Whereas and in the second trimester disappears because by then the uterus has grown up so big that it is risen above the level of the bladder and therefore doesn't press on the bladder anymore. But it may press on the intestines and may lead to constipation. So she passes urine more often due to pressure of the uterus on the urinary bladder and the symptoms disappear in the second trimester when the uterus becomes so big that it rises above the level of the bladder. Now we move further, almost the eighth week, 52 days and you can see a remarkable resemblance with the human being and uh, this is at uh, 13 weeks, still more human looking. Uh, now, in the first trimester, there's frequency of urination and uh, morning sickness, any problems in the second trimester. In the second trimester, which is the most comfortable trimester, uh, several yoga asanas can be safely done. However, the only problems might be constipation, which can be taken care of generally by uh, an adequate diet, at the most supplementing it with some isab goal. And if this constipation is not cared for, piles might develop by because of repeatedly, you know, straining at the stool and that uh, reduces, uh, uh, sort of that compromises the return of blood from the rectum to the heart and therefore these blood vessels swell up and might lead to piles. There's a fetus at 26 weeks. Now, let's look at the hormones of pregnancy because now we are getting closer to delivery and how does that happen? Now, this is uh, the human chorionic gonadotropin which comes from that soup and uh, when the placenta takes uh, comes in, uh, takes over, then the placenta continues to secrete this HCG, but then gradually it drops. And uh, these are the estrogen and the progesterone levels, which keep rising to levels far above that what happens in the non-pregnant state. And these are also coming from the placenta during all this period. But then near the full term, that is near the 40th week, you find that the progesterone level particularly that is the hormone which was uh, inhibiting the uterine contraction, the hormone that was keeping the uterus relaxed, the hormone that was uh, uh, leaving the uh, baby undisturbed, not trying to expel it, that hormone starts coming down. And this is one of the things that might contribute to the delivery. Now, before we go to delivery itself, a few tips which my, uh, for pregnancy about sleep. How much sleep does a pregnant woman need? Generally longer than in the non-pregnant state. She needs about 10 hours of sleep in a day. Uh, but at the same time, if she finds it difficult to fall asleep, she should not take sleeping pills because it could be harmful to the baby. Not only sleeping pills, any drugs, even painkillers should be not taken except when prescribed. So as a rule of the thumb, a pregnant woman should not take any drugs except when prescribed by a doctor. Diet. And since the uh, mother has to support also the growth of the baby, she does need extra food. And uh, as a rule of the thumb, about uh, 10 to 15 percent more per day than in the non-pregnant state. But does this extra food have to be in the form of some special foods? Not necessarily. No special diet is really necessary uh, because uh, the uh, percentage of energy that should come from proteins stays essentially constant. So what was able to provide enough protein, the type of foods that were able to provide enough protein before pregnancy will be able to provide enough protein also during pregnancy if taken in a larger amount. 
because if you take more of the same foods we get also more of protein we get more of everything that is there in that food and uh, that is generally quite enough which means that as anybody else in a healthy diet this pregnant woman should also take uh, a diet the staple of which is a combination of cereals and pulses and these cereals and pulses should be in the form of whole grains as much as possible not refined grains and uh, along with that she should also take uh, a moderate amount of uh, a judiciously chosen fat and uh, enough of uh, fruits and vegetables four to five helpings a day and uh, milk and milk products in moderation and spices in moderation so the general principles remain essentially the same as for any healthy person but the quantity has to be increased and the quantity has to be greater during lactation than even during pregnancy because the baby is now of a bigger size and for the first 6 months uh, through the mother's milk it it is uh, the baby is being entirely nourished by the mother so the mother is nourishing the baby uh, even after pregnancy for the first 6 months if she breast breastfeeds the baby and therefore the requirements during lactation are even greater than during pregnancy uh around 300 calories extra during pre- per day during pregnancy and about 500 to 600 calories extra during lactation and to quite some extent uh, the body weight and uh, the feeling of hunger will be able to guide the woman as to how much extra to take and since constipation can be a problem during pregnancy in the second and the third trimester Uh, that may need attention and uh, the one can supplement the diet apart from taking whole grains and fruits and vegetables and plenty of water this can also be supplemented with uh, isabgol but otherwise no special diet is really necessary and at same time no major restrictions are called for either during morning sickness it is helpful if uh, uh, the woman avoids heavy and spicy foods and takes small frequent meals because a heavy meal uh, even if it is not made of heavy foods or fried foods a heavy meal itself will uh, make the woman feel worse feel more nauseated and feel more like vomiting there can be some uh, cravings during pregnancy and these may be catered to by and large they're quite harmless and uh, since uh, adequate nourishment of the Uh, mother and the baby is important and uh, uh, particularly limiting our things like uh, iron and uh, folic acid and uh, uh, calcium and so on these are often pres- supplem- prescribed as supplements and to be on the safe side they may be taken in the doses that are prescribed not uh, mega doses not too much of an excess but in the doses that are prescribed they can be taken and uh, uh one can also opt for uh, ayurvedic uh, advice uh, which uh, also has a lot of value to it and may take care of some of these supplements uh, during pregnancy and uh, also uh, there are formulations available in ayurveda which will facilitate delivery which will improve the supply of milk during lactation so all those things are also available also in ayurveda so uh, this is some of the things we can say about the diet during pregnancy if a woman does not take enough food during pregnancy the f- baby does not suffer much because the baby acts like a parasite from whatever is available to extract enough nourishment for itself the mother suffers more than the baby because of malnutrition and this again is important because suppose there is calcium deficiency the baby may get enough calcium but uh, the woman ends up with weaker bones which will be impossible to strengthen later on because you know once calcium has been removed from the bones you cannot deposit it back easily and therefore the woman will become more vulnerable to fractures if the woman does not get enough iron the baby will be able to extract enough iron for itself but the woman will get anemic at the end of pregnancy and therefore that she'll feel extremely weak and uh, therefore even the effort re- delivery will become more difficult so the in general uh, the mother suffers more than the baby and for the health of both which are both important 
it's important to pay attention to the diet and take the extra amount that is really needed. There may be sometimes uh, some uh, thing to be done because if the woman is feeling nauseated, feeling like vomiting, then uh, there may be certain types of foods uh, which are not fried foods, not heavy in that sense, but which can which are a little calorie dense. That might help because in a smaller volume they are able to provide more calories. Things like say, nuts. So that is the why uh, you know this traditional advice of giving some nuts to the pregnant woman does have make some sense. But uh, apart from sort of uh, this sort of a uh, rationale based on common sense, a special diet, especially for pregnancy, is not really necessary. How about yogic practices during pregnancy? Here the advice is highly variable. It varies from one extreme, which is highly conservative, that is, don't uh, do any yogic practices during pregnancy. From that to the other end, that is, you can do every yogic practice during pregnancy, you'll find all types of advice. Depending upon the person who is giving that advice, what type of personal bias that person has. So the advice on yogic practices is extremely variable and covers that entire spectrum from no yogic practices at all to almost every yogic practice. Uh, but uh, sort of to find the golden mean, uh, here are a few suggestions, but then uh, this is not the right time to talk about this in detail. Uh, that we shall take up in the next course, uh, yes.04. But uh, just to give a little introduction here, it is. Uh, the second semester, which is the safest. In the first semester, first trimester, sorry, not semester, it should be trimester. Huh? Semester is in schools and colleges, six month period. This is a trimester, which is a three month period. So it is the second trimester, which is the safest. Sorry for that mistake there. Uh, it is the second trimester, which is the safest. In the first trimester, many yogic practices may increase the risk of an abortion. And in the third trimester, the abdomen is too unwieldy for some of the yogic practices. It is the second trimester that is the safest. In general, the postures to be avoided during pregnancy are the inverted postures, again common sense. Abdominal twists, no intense contraction of the abdomen should uh, uh, take place as in the boat pose and certainly no Surya Namaskar. And uh, as the abdomen grows bigger in size, particularly in the second trimester, one may use pillows to neutralize the effect of the large abdomen. Some of the yogic practices which may be done are the hip opening postures like Supta Baddha Konasana. Now, Supta Baddha Konasana is essentially like the butterfly pose. You know, in the, in the loosening, we do sometimes that butterfly movement, uh, the sitting posture. Something like that, so posture like the beginning of the butterfly. Uh, movement can be adopted also in the lying down position. And that is what is called Supta Baddha Konasan and uh, that opens up the hips. Among the pranayamas, alternate nostril breathing can be done throughout pregnancy, helps in balancing the autonomic nervous system, keeps the woman relaxed, anulom vilom pranayam. And uh, no kapalabhati in the third trimester. And most important, Listen to your body. You would know what is right for you and what is uh, not right. And uh, yogic practices are in general easier during the second pregnancy than in the first one. Second pregnancy in general in every respect is easier than the first one, both because of the experience and because the body has been somewhat prepared for the next pregnancy. And uh, the complicated pregnancies might require strict bed rest, and then of course the yogic practices are out. For example, placenta previa. When the placenta, instead of developing on the side, develops at a place from where it can be easily detached. So uh, in those cases, disturbance of the uterus is not desirable and therefore the woman may need bed rest rather than yogic practices. Now all this discussion was basically to remove this uh, notion which is also quite common that all yogic practices are banned during pregnancy. That's an extremely conservative view based more on ignorance and personal prejudice rather than on facts. Because there are several studies which have shown that in fact yogic practices can be very helpful. They can make uh, delivery more comfortable and easier. 
and uh, they also give mental relaxation which is important and they also give an opportunity for a loving and sacred communication with the baby so when the woman is trying to connect with the divine is chanting some mantras during the practice that also gets communicated to the baby and she can do it consciously with this we can we shall return in a moment again now when to expect delivery uh the way we can calculate the expected date of delivery is by starting with the date of the last menstrual period add to that 9 months and 1 week for example if the last menstrual period was on the 5th of march the expected date of delivery is 12th december so 5th of march the third month add to that 9 months the 12th month and 1 week that's 7 to 5 12th december and usually delivery takes place within plus minus 1 week of the expected date of delivery what leads to the delivery is a combination of mechanical factors and hormonal changes one doesn't know exactly everything that is responsible for delivery but uh, these are the two things which are quite obvious and they contribute the mechanical factors are the stretching of the uterus and the hormonal changes are on one hand the withdrawal of hormones like progesterone particularly and to some extent estrogen these hormones their level comes down and uh, instead comes in another hormone oxytocin which is released from the uh, posterior pituitary and uh, that leads to contraction of the uterus progesterone relaxes the uterus oxytocin leads to contraction of the uterus now well, labor pains labor pains are amongst the most severe pains experienced in good health because a woman is basically a pregnant woman is healthy she is not sick she is going through a normal physiological process and in good health this is one of the severest pains experienced and uh, anyone who has seen a woman in labor in the hospital and all medical students have seen that uh the person cannot help feeling extremely grateful to its mother to his or her mother uh to start with the labor pains are mild the duration is about 30 seconds at a time the uterus contracts remains in a state of spasm for half a minute or so and this repeats itself every 10 to 30 minutes as time passes they get more severe they last longer and become more frequent at the end of the first stage first stage is from the onset of labor that is the beginning of the first pains till the full dilatation of the cervix of the uterus uh during the first day at the end of the first stage the duration of the pains is about 1 minute at a time every 3 to 5 minutes and uh, how long does the first stage last the first stage lasts in longer in the first pregnancy usually 12 to 24 hours in subsequent pregnancy the range could be from 6 to 8 hours and sometimes even less some women deliver very easily and quickly uh so that is the the duration of the first stage and uh, in the second stage the woman needs bearing down efforts and that is when the baby gets delivered second stage is the delivery of the baby and the third stage is the delivery of the placenta uh there is a story about a man who was uh, driving his wife down a long distance uh, about uh, 200 kilometers or something the hospital was far away from where they stayed and he was driving his car very fast to take his uh, pregnant wife who had uh, gone into labor pains he was take, trying to drive as fast as possible uh, to get to the hospital and uh, he was getting anxious uh, how long uh, it will be before the baby is actually delivered and it shouldn't happen in the car so he was talking to the doctor and the doctor asked uh, how frequent are the pains hmm? because you can see that the frequency keeps going up as uh, one proceeds from the uh, in beginning to the uh, end of the first stage from 10 to 30 minutes they occur every 3 to 5 minutes so he was driving at 120 kilometers an hour and uh, uh, he said well it seems uh, she is getting uh, uh, pains uh, after every 2 kilometers uh, took uh, one episode of pain every 2 kilometers that's the way he was trying to sort of communicate the frequency of the labor pains uh. now coming to the delivery itself now in the delivery 
Uh, there are hormonal factors like withdrawal of the estrogen and progesterone and release of oxytocin, which contracts the uterus. Apart from that, the stretch itself stimulates contraction. And here there's a positive feedback mechanism at work. The stretch of the uterus stimulates contraction of the uterus. The contraction reduces the space available and therefore increases the stretch. And this increased stretch stimulates further contraction. So you can see there's a positive feedback mechanism at work. And uh, this takes place at many points in reproduction. We saw it happening in case of uh, the menstrual cycle at one point, the positive feedback. And this is another point where this positive feedback occurs. And we'll see this positive feedback again occurring during lactation. So anyway, now coming back to this uh, delivery process, here this positive feedback is because stretch leads to contraction, contraction leads to further stretch, and this further stretch leads to further contraction. This type of a positive feedback happens also on the path of yoga. Uh, just like labor pains, there is a, a painful process, a difficult process uh, of sadhana in yoga. And like the labor pains, again, it's an enjoyable pain. Looks contradictory, but then here, the woman is doing it for the love of the child. And in yoga, you do it for the love of the divine. And therefore, in spite of the difficulties involved, it feels good. And uh, as here, over there also, there's a positive feedback. As the effort continues, the person experiences more and more of joy and peace in life. And the person, as the person experiences more joy and peace, the encouragement for putting in further effort for continuing on the journey increases. So again, there is a positive feedback at work. And in a way like this delivery, in the process of yoga also, the person keeps getting delivered again and again from his previous ignorant state to a less ignorant state. So it's in a way rebirth taking place all the time on the path of yoga as well. One is dying to one's old self and getting born to a new self, becoming a different type of person, being born to a different type of human being. Now, this is a little more realistic picture of uh, the delivery. This is at the end of the first stage when the cervix is fully dilated and the head can be accommodated there. In the second stage, the head has come out and the rest of the baby will be sewn out. And in the third stage, it is only the placenta left inside to be delivered. <laughs> now coming to the influences on the baby inside the mother's womb. The mother, while talking to some women in Japan, uh, uh, told them that true maternity begins with the conscious creation of a being with the willed shaping of a soul coming to develop and utilize a new body. So it is not just a sort of a biological process to be gone through. It's a process of a conscious creation, creating a new human being, putting one's consciousness into the process. And one can by doing that, will, what type of a child would be born? And uh, this is important because the children are the future. And uh, to some extent, the type of child that uh, we bring forth is the type of future that the world will have. And uh, Sri Aurobindo in the Mother's Vision, as you know, is highly futuristic, that we are poised for the next leap in evolution, which will essentially be the result of uh, a higher level of consciousness and uh, therefore uh, this is important because it is possible for the mother to uh, create a baby which has uh, a higher level of consciousness and a greater potential for uh, developing the consciousness further during life. The mother has that opportunity. Now this might look a little unscientific and weird but uh, in fact uh, all creation is only a manifestation of the same supreme consciousness of the divine. And therefore, any one mode of consciousness can influence another mode of consciousness. For example, the mind is one mode of consciousness, the body another. 
the mind is a subtle mode and the body is a gross mode but the mind can affect the body there's a mind body relationship and uh, in the same way the mother's mind and the baby's uh, mind and body are also expressions of the same consciousness and being so intimately in contact it is only to be expected that uh, the mother's mind will be able to influence the baby's mind and also the body one might say that the body is uh, not very plastic and the body in any case will take the type of shape as it dictated by the genes but the mother talks of a story where once a woman came to her with a daughter who was uh, not only extremely good looking but she resembled the painting of a child by the well known british uh, painter joshua reynolds it seems joshua reynolds was fond of uh, making uh, pictures of children and uh, what the woman said was when the mother told her that uh, this ba- this child looks exactly like a painting i think of by reynolds uh, the child's mother said that uh, will you believe it that uh, throughout pregnancy i had in front of me a painting by reynolds which had a beautiful child and i would keep wishing particular all the time particularly in the morning uh, as when i got up and at night before i went to bed i would uh, pray for my child to look as beautiful as this and uh, true enough when the child was born it looked like uh, that painting now if the body which is so uh, resistant to any uh, uh, change the body which doesn't have the type of plasticity which the mind has if the body can be affected to that extent why not the mind and uh, therefore uh, one can influence the uh, consciousness of the child which will be expressed through the type of the mind that the child has by the mother wishing willing and willing it and that's why when we are talking of yogic practices i said that that is also an opportunity for a conscious and sacred communication with the baby just to give you a sample of reynolds paintings there is a very large number of them available on the net i just picked up two samples i don't know which of these that woman was looking at who gave birth to a baby looking like one of these paintings but as you can see that uh, these are beautiful pictures and uh, reynolds it seems was uh, very uh, fond of drawing children's uh, children in his paintings and that's why we have such a large number available and uh, this in fact became a controversial issue in uh, 2017 about 5 years ago when uh, the central council for research on yoga and naturopathy came up with uh, a booklet providing some guidance to pregnant women and in that the booklet said among other things that uh, the woman should be careful about uh, her thoughts and feelings during pregnancy have uh, positive thoughts and positive feelings and also that she should avoid non vegetarian food and uh, then you know the uh the newspaper after talking to some doctors said that this is all rubbish the minds the mother's mind can't influence the baby and uh, the mother should not give up uh, non vegetarian food because she needs extra protein during pregnancy and therefore her nutrition will suffer if she takes uh, only vegetarian food now doctors are experts but expertise in one area does not necessarily make the person an expert in another area and uh, therefore does not authorize that person to give opinions on an area about which he is ignorant by and large medical students don't learn all these things in medical school and therefore it's understandable that the doctors whom they talk to were quite ignorant about these things and uh, about nutrition also although it may come to the general public as a surprise about nutrition also doctors learn very little in the medical course all over the world and uh, therefore to say think that uh, non vegetarian food will be important because the woman needs more protein also is not very surprising but the fact is as i told you that uh, uh, if the woman takes that additional quantity of food the protein requirements will take care of itself because more food of the type that a healthy person should in any case take uh, will provide enough protein and this can come uh, from a vegetarian diet a vegetarian diet is quite 
adequate for providing enough protein both in quantity and quality and when it comes to the mother's mind influencing the baby uh will not go into mythological tales uh which uh, are to- which talk about it i'll go instead to uh, some experiments done in uh, the premier institute of the country the all india institute of medical sciences new delhi i was not a part of those experiments but i know those experiments in which one of my colleagues from our department and one from anatomy were both involved and what they did was uh, to play music to uh, the chicks growing inside fertilized eggs so they had a control group for uh, which that music was not played you know the chick takes about 21 days to for the egg to hatch and the chick to come out so during this period uh, the fertilized eggs were exposed to music in the experimental group and not exposed to music in the control group it was found that uh, when the chicks were born the structure of the brain was different in the two groups so if uh, the structure of the brain can be affected by what the egg or the growing chick in the egg listens to while it is growing up and brain again is a uh, gross structure we're not talking about subtle effects on the mind but if the brain is affected chances are that the mind would also be affected but at the gross level in the brain also you can demonstrate differences as a result of the type of environment the child experiences including the music that is played to a growing chick so if it can happen to a growing chick why not to a human being and uh, stimulated by this uh, by this uh, article in the newspaper which uh, rubbished what had been uh, published by the central council for research on yoga and naturopathy i wrote a blog which is still available on speaking tree the, the title of the blog was does the mother's mind bend the baby before it is born well delivery is only the end of the beginning it is the end of uh, what began 9 months earlier as a bond between the mother and the baby that bond continues for another at least 6 months could continue for a year or more to breastfeeding and that again is important not only for that bonding to continue but also for the health of both the baby and the mother the background for the breastfeeding has already been prepared as we have seen the capacity to secrete milk uh, has been created through all these hormones estrogen progesterone which are in at high levels during pregnancy and uh, the hcs uh, which uh, stimulates milk synthesis like prolactin and uh, later on this continues with the help of prolactin when the after pregnancy when hcs will not be available from the placenta prolactin continues the job and uh, during pregnancy itself secretion of milk is inhibited by the same hormones estrogen and progesterone which are equipping the breast with uh, getting the factory ready for milk but same time the production uh, starts essentially after delivery with the help of prolactin and uh, when what is produced is uh, sent out of the factory with the help of oxytocin the hormone that is released from the posterior pituitary and uh, for oxytocin to be released uh what is needed is uh, a reflex which is initiated by the baby bringing its mouth in contact with the with its mother's breast so that stimulates uh both the emotional as well as you can see the sensory component of the reflex and the result is that uh, the uh that oxytocin is released from pituitary and then that leads to a contraction of those little little tubes ducts in the breast which will expel the milk out of the breast and as the milk is expelled the baby experiences the taste the baby enjoys it and it clings more uh, fondly to the breast and when it clings more fondly this reflex gets stimulated further the uh, its mother enjoys it and uh, the reflex is further stimulated 
and that releases more oxytocin, more milk is expelled. And this goes on till the baby feels full. When it feels full, it shows some disinterest. And when it shows disinterest, it starts moving away. And removal of this contact with the breast starts shutting out of this reflex so that uh, then further milk will not flow for very long. So that is how, again, there's a positive feedback uh, to work. The release of the milk makes the baby cling uh, harder, better, more warmly, and uh, that in turn releases still more oxytocin. So, and more oxytocin, more milk, further contact. So this is a positive feedback till it is necessary. And uh, as uh, an oxytocin, of course, the hormone present not only in women, but also in men and uh, serves a similar purpose. It serves in both men and women, the purpose of bonding in other relationships also. It has been shown that uh, a hug can release a lot of oxytocin. <laughs> now, some more uh, uh, related things. Uh, prolactin, the hormone that uh, stimulates the synthesis of milk during lactation, inhibits the release of gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. And we saw the other day that uh, this gonadotropin releasing hormone is important for stimulating the secretion of uh, FSH and LH from the ovary, which keeps the menstrual cycle running. Now, in the because of this inhibition, the ovaries remain inactive. The breast is active, but the ovaries are inactive, and therefore there is no menstruation during lactation, and there is no ovulation during lactation. And even after lactation, the cycles may remain anovulatory, that is, without shedding an egg for about six months. So, I know, nutritionally speaking, uh, at least six months of breastfeeding is uh, required, but longer doesn't do any harm so long as we supplement breastfeeding after six months of age uh, with supplements. And uh, there are traditional sort of cultures in which uh, breastfeeding continues even up to five years of age till the baby is five. That may be a little on the higher side, but one to one and a half year of breastfeeding is not at all abnormal. So one to one and a half year of breastfeeding plus another six years when the cycles may start but still remain without shedding an egg, egg gives a automatic inbuilt spacing out of two babies, which means two babies are unlikely to be born less than two years apart. So a two-year gap between two babies is more or less built in so long as one feeds the baby for about one and a half year after birth, which will be good for the baby, uh, making it healthy, healthier. Breastfeeding has been found repeatedly uh, now to uh, be better than bottle feeding in many respects. Bottle feeding, you know, basically has uh, a few important handicaps. Firstly, uh, it's very expensive. Bottle feeding is expensive and therefore many who take to bottle feeding cannot afford it in the right amount. And therefore they dilute the formula more than is proper. And uh, the result is that the child gets malnourished. Secondly, many of the poor families which may take to breast to bottle feeding because it is fashionable, Fortunately, it's no longer fashionable. But when it was fashionable, many poor families took to it because they thought it would probably be better because the rich people do it. Uh, they cannot afford refrigerators and therefore the milk becomes unhygienic. They give also the leftover formula feed to the baby, which uh, gets uh, spoilt because of no refrigeration and the baby keeps repeatedly getting attacks of diarrhea. And the third reason uh, why breastfeeding has, is better than bottle feeding is that breast milk has a characteristic composition, a composition which is optimum for the baby. And no amount of tinkering with other milks or manufacturing uh, a formula which is as close to breast milk as possible has been successful. So essentially, all efforts to mimic and copy completely human breast milk have been frustrating. None of these efforts has been totally successful. And the, therefore, uh, for all these reasons, it is considered that uh, breastfeeding is far better than bottle feeding. And on top of that, built into this breastfeeding is also a mechanism for spacing out the interval between two children 
which also is really required for the baby to be well cared for. So for providing good care to the baby, it's important that the child uh, does not have to face another sibling for the first two years of its life. And if the baby is breastfed for about one and a half year, that interval will be between two babies will be automatically ensured. Not only that, it does something also for the baby. Repeated release of oxytocin would contract the uterus as happens during delivery. It contracts the uterus also after delivery. And this helps the uterus get smaller so that it gets back to its normal pre-pregnant size much faster. And this is something which uh, all women want to happen. They want the tummy to get to the same size as it was before. And oxytocin helps in that. So that's also something which uh, lactation does because lactation means repeated release of oxytocin every time the woman breastfeeds the baby. Well, all this really should not be very necessary. Uh, and uh, the love that a mother has for the baby is instinctive. Uh, in fact, uh, in the ordinary world, maternal love comes closest to divine love, closer to divine love than any other type of love. Uh, it is unconditional. It does not expect anything in return like divine love. The only way it differs from divine love is it is not universal. It is for a specific baby. So it's not universal in character, but it has the other two important characteristics of divine love. It is unconditional and it does not expect anything in return. Suggested reading this popular book, The Human Machine. These two textbooks, Fundamentals of Physiology and Understanding Medical Physiology. And uh, plenty of pictures in this presentation. And most of them were taken from Dottoro and Grabowski. The Principles of Anatomy and Physiology, 10th edition. Gratitude to the mother and Sri Aurobindo for making these sessions possible. And a big thank you to all the mothers of the world, some of whom are likely to be present in this session right now, and many more would probably watch it later. We can close today's session and meet for the next session on Monday. Thank you, everyone. We end with a moment of silence. Mm -hmm.